Good afternoon. Um, welcome. Uh, this is um, um, a lecture, <coughs> part of the Jean Monnet uh, Chair at the University of Trento. I hold. My name is Roberto Belloni, and uh, the lecture will be posted uh, on the website of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Trento um, under my project, which I coordinate with the Osservatorio Balcani e Caucaso based in Trento, and um, which is titled the European Union and the Western Balkans Enlargement and Resilience. Within this context, we have uh, the opportunity to have a few, um, a few guests. And, uh, um, and today it is a really a great pleasure to have uh, uh, as our guest speaker, Irene Costantini, <clears throat> who is a, um, a postdoc researcher at the University of Napoli, and uh, she is currently um, Ernest Mack Research Fellow at the Austrian Institute for International Affairs in Vienna. She's an expert uh, on, uh, particularly, on, on, she has studied or worked on, on a number of issues, but in particular, state building in the Middle East and North Africa. And I'm not going to, 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 to mention uh, all of her publications, etc. but uh, I think it, I very much would like to mention a, a very interesting book that she published uh, not long ago, um, titled State, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> State Building in the Middle East and North Africa, the Aftermath of Regime Change. And today, Irene is going to talk to us um, about uh, um, resilience and fragility in the European Union uh, um, uh, strategy, security strategy. Um, I think this is everything I wanted to say, and I, I have to also formally remind everyone that this um, um, lecture is uh, taped, and uh, so um, the, the students and everyone who is connected at this time uh, is welcome uh, um, at the end of the lecture to ask uh, questions, and, uh, but if you do and uh, you appear on um, screen, you, you are also giving the permission to um, to be uh, recorded and then and then to, to see your face on screen again uh, the tape in the tape um, otherwise you can ask questions in the chat um, I think this is everything I, I, I plan to say so um, um, I guess we can start Irene thank you very much for being with us and I uh, Irene will will talk for about one hour more or less and we and we and then of course there will be the opportunity to ask uh, questions so, so thank you again and thank you for um, everyone who's connected at this time for the lecture thank you Roberto for the introduction and good afternoon everyone good afternoon to all the students who are remotely connected to attend this lecture. Um, before I share my screen so that you can see my slides as well, uh, I would like to um, say a few words from the very beginning. Um, as the situation does not allow us yet to be uh, sitting in the same room, I kindly ask you to treat this uh, online meeting as if we were sitting in the same room. Um, so, of course, I'm going to leave some space for discussion at the end of my presentation, but I really encourage you to stop me um, uh, while I am presenting in case uh, you need any clarification. So you can use the function of, uh, you know, raising your hand. And if, I'm, uh, if I don't stop, uh, please feel free to, to open the mic and to interrupt me to ask uh, any question, okay? So that we can, uh, um, you can follow uh, as best as, uh, uh, as best as you can. So uh, now I'll start by sharing my screen. I hope you uh, can see it clearly. And so also to uh, no, uh, view slideshow. So I think now you can actually see my screen. 
And so the slides, uh, as Roberto mentioned, this uh, lecture is titled Fragility and Resilience in the European Union Security Strategy. Actually, this is the same title of an article that a colleague of mine, Roberto Bal uh, Robert, Eduardo Baldaro, and I um, wrote and published uh, uh, recently. Um, so you can also have a look at the, um, at the article uh, if you need any information on this topic. Um, what I will be doing in the next hour or so, uh, uh, quite a standard outline of this presentation. So I will start with some introductory uh, remarks on the theme of uh, uh, the lecture. Um, then uh, presenting you the methodology that we follow for conducting this research. Then we will move on to present fragility as a policy paradigm and resilience as, a two, as another policy paradigm. We will discuss some of the findings and this will lead us to uh, some concluding remarks. Um, uh, as a way of introducing the topics, um, uh, the topic of uh, today's lecture, uh, the question that uh, um, uh, that we tried at least uh, to answer uh, in uh, uh, this research is how the European uh, approach to conflict and crisis management has changed over time and what are the main assumptions informing this change. Now, a few words on what led us to this research question. Uh, together with my colleague and also based on uh, other discussions that we had with other colleagues, including Roberto, um, um, we noticed that change in an approach uh, in the practice uh, uh, in uh, dealing with conflict, uh, in, with conflict and crisis, uh, specifically with conflict, uh, um, uh, compared to uh, what was the standard treatment of conflict and crisis uh, at the turn of the 21st century. Um, this led us to question whether uh, this was not only by chance or uh, driven by, by contextual factors uh, related to individual cases, but actually was part of a changing approach uh, um, at the international level. Uh, so we focused on the European Union, of course. Um, uh, as you uh, saw from the title, and we tried to understand whether there has been a change or not and what informed this change. Um, this research question sits within a broader context, the context that we have been seeing over the last uh, decades or so, um, although uh, the pandemic has, uh, of course, changed the world in which we live. Even before this, uh, um, there were some uh, um, uh, there were some events uh, that, in our view, um, influenced the way in which the European Union uh, was uh, uh, designing and implementing its foreign policy specifically towards its eastern and southern neighborhood. Among these uh, events that create a different context in a way, uh, of course, we can cite the economic crisis of 2007-2008 that reduced the, um, uh, the financial support to conflict and crisis management worldwide. Uh, there are the events of the Arab, Arab uprisings, which were particularly important for the European Union and that showed a sort of a gap between demands for democracy uh, in some countries in the Middle East and North Africa region, um, while there was um, uh, a, yeah, a gap in the demands for democracy and in the offer of democracy promotion programs at the European uh, level. We can also cite the, uh, the crisis and the conflict in uh, Ukraine that created um, um, uh, a tense environment uh, in the eastern neighborhood of the European Union with an increasing tension with um, Russia. 
uh, and then you see uh, in brackets the migration crisis. Of course, we need to uh, problematize uh, this word of uh, migra uh, this term of um, uh, thinking about migration as a crisis, but in the way in which in, uh, the way in which the European Union perceived the topic of migration was certainly as a crisis, and also the terrorist attacks. Uh, uh, we can cite here the attacks in Paris, in Brussels, in between 2015 and 2016, uh, led by a new terrorist organization, the Islamic State, in uh, the Islamic State, um, uh, that uh, was threatening uh, the security and the way of life, as uh, uh, then the European Union defined it, uh, at its very core. So not only in the periphery, but also within Europe. Um, this research is focused on the European Union, yes, uh, but um, uh, but this is not something that is exclusive to the European Union. Uh, so while we try to trace a change in approach to conflict and crisis management at the European level, we are also uh, quite aware uh, that this is a change that uh, uh, doesn't stop there. Um, by the way, I'm currently conducting a quite similar work uh, centered on uh, instead on uh, the United Nations, uh, where based on uh, key documents published in uh, 2015 and from 2015 work onwards, and some of the elements that uh, I will highlight uh, in. Uh, um, in the next uh, slides are also valid at the uh, level of the um, United Nations. So, so it's not something that is exclusive to the European Union, but we think, I think that this is part of a broader change in approach to conflict and crisis worldwide. Um, another point to mention about the European Union, of course, as we all know, there is always a tension between the European, when it comes to uh, the foreign and security policy of the European Union, there is always a tension between the European Union and its member states, right? Um, here uh, in this research, we are not really um, delving into this tension precisely because we mostly work at the level of discourse. So our analysis is based on documents produced at the European Union level by the European institutions. Uh, then, of course, we know that the practice may uh, be uh, different. And of course, the tension between member states and the European Union is uh, quite evident when it comes to the practice. But at the level of discourse, there is a shared discourse at the European Union level. And, and, and we focus at that level. A last word uh, as an introduction is on uh, this term, resilience. Um, uh, and here it is important to say that we limit the analysis when we talk about the uh, resilience as a policy paradigm. It is important to say that we limit the analysis to conflict and crisis management. Uh, we all know after one year of uh, the pandemic that the word resilience has been used in basically every area of policy um, within the European Union. Uh, it has been used to describe also different things uh, um, in different areas and so on. Here we concentrate only when we speak about resilience as a policy uh, paradigm, uh, we concentrate the, the analysis on conflict and crisis management. Then, of course, some of the elements that we highlight may be useful also in other areas of, of policies, but this is also um, a way to, uh, you know, reduce um, uh, the amount of reference to resilience and also try to see how then um, uh, what this concept means and how it is uh, applied. Um, moving forward, um, let me move forward. Uh, okay, uh, methodology. So this uh, research paper, as I said just before, is based on a discursive analysis. So we analyzed text produced by the European Union. 
And this comparison has been mostly built around two key documents produced by the European Union that are the 2003 European Security Strategy and the 2016 European Union uh, Global Strategy. Uh, these two documents are uh, basically the attempt of the European Union to set a framework uh, to address uh, the um, uh, security threats um, and identifying ways of addressing these security threats. Uh, these two documents are uh, comparable, even though they are quite different in nature. Uh, the uh, 2003 European Security Strategy is certainly um, shorter documents compared to the 2016 version of the European Union Global Strategy, and they also reflect a changed architecture at the European Union level, with the 2016 uh, um, global strategy being the first post Lisbon strategy produced at the European Union level. Of course, the comparison is centered on these two key documents, uh, but it's not only, um, but it's not limited to them. And it's, of course, based also on the um, quite huge amount of uh, papers, documents uh, that have been published and written um, around these two uh, key documents at the European Union level. We treat, uh, based on this uh, methodology, we treat fragility and resilience as policy paradigms. And here it's important to uh, tell you, of course, what we mean by policy paradigms. Policy paradigms are uh, frameworks that define how policy and political actors understand and interpret their environment delineate the nature of the problems they are facing, identifying their role and elaborating policy solutions. So basically, basically a policy paradigm is a way of uh, um, creating a sort of a word view that informs not only the um, nature of the problem, but also the nature of the solution. And try, of course, and, and it tries to connect the two, the problem and the solution. Um, um, uh, and we analyze these policy paradigms, fragility and resilience, based on four dimensions. So basically what these documents, these uh, huge amount of documents say uh, in terms of um, uh, what is the understanding of the European Union of the international system, um, uh, where and what they identify as a locus of threats and a source of threats, which role they attribute to the international community and within the international community, what role they attribute to the European Union and the type of the solution that they propose. Uh, in a way, all these elements serves the purpose, as I just said, of uh, on the one end, identifying and interpreting a problem and connecting it to a proposed solution at the European Union level. Having said that, I think we can start with presenting the two policy paradigms. So the first one is the one centered around the concept of state fragility. Um, um, state is uh, in uh, 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 state, um, so we talk about fragility as a policy paradigm, but this uh, aspect of fragility is uh, um, always connected to the state dimension. Um, the issue of state fragility um, as a key uh, concept, and in our view, as a policy. Uh, paradigms emerged at the end of the Cold War, so we are in the 90s, and specifically in a, in a more pronounced way from the beginning of the global war on terror. Uh, so from 2001 onwards, so after the terrorist attacks uh, of 9-11, uh, in which uh, basically what happened is that um, uh, the state fragility paradigm connected the fragility of the state and its institutions 
with the main source of threats and insecurity at the international level. So the basic discourse at the turn of the 21st century is that the uh, international peace and security was mostly threatened by the um, by fragile states and failed states. This is because the states were representing uh, key threats in terms of uh, um, as far as they couldn't really control uh, what happened in their territories and they could become um, a source of terrorism, for instance, but also a source of uh, um, um, networked uh, um, criminal organizations, uh, poverty, uh, and so on. Um, the state failure and fragility paradigm represented a world in which uh, states were um, different in qualitative terms. So uh, it describes a continuum between uh, fully formed and fully functioning states based on a Weberian standard model of the state, which is found mostly uh, among uh, European and Western states, and the rest of the world in which we see, a, um, yes, as I said, a continuum of state experiences that are uh, rather different from the standard, the standard model. Uh, this idea, uh, which contrasts uh, um, uh, full statehood and fragile statehood, is also linked uh, with an overall environment um, and uh, a, an overall vision based on Western liberal values and institutions. So we cannot really separate this idea of state fragility from a broader worldview in which uh, what prevails is uh, um, our Western liberal values and institutions. First, uh, uh, first of all, the idea of liberal democracy, a market economy, uh, uh, and uh, a form of multilateral cooperation at the international level. Uh, so this um, policy paradigm of state fragility really sits within this view uh, that uh, grew out from the 90s of, uh, as, uh, as you know, you, uh, the end of history. So the only model in town is the model uh, centered around Western liberal values and institutions. Um, uh, as a policy paradigm, state fragility gained policy and political popularity. So if you go back in time and you sit between the 90s and the uh, early 2000s, uh, the, um, the term fragility, state fragility, state failure was quite predominant, uh, both at the academic and the policy level. Uh, so was informing a lot of uh, the discussion, uh, including, for instance, the intervention in uh, Afghanistan in 2011 and the intervention in Iraq in 2003. So it was quite prominent, uh, but it also attracted great criticism and the criticism came mostly from the academic literature, uh, saying, for instance, that this was a uh, um, uh, uh, this was uh, more the, um, um, uh, the result of uh, uh, policy objectives worldwide rather than based on uh, uh, solid analytical ground. Uh, the criticism is quite uh, vast, especially um, during the first uh, uh, decade of the 2000s. So for instance, uh, uh, claiming that uh, um, uh, the uh, term state fragility um, contains within it a number of state experiences that are quite different. And so we cannot really understand them only by making reference to, its, uh, uh, to their fragility or their failure. Um, then, of course, if you want, we can discuss more about what other elements of criticism were raised against this idea of state fragility. 
But let's now move to uh, resilience as our second policy paradigms um, that actually <clears throat> we claim in our article is actually the result of the failure of the state fragility policy paradigm. So um, it becomes uh, prominent uh, well into the 21st century um, and uh, it is in part uh, the result of the disillusionment with the liberal international view, understanding of Western uh, actors uh, and how they were uh, thinking about conflict and crisis and how they were designing their solution for conflict and crisis. So basically, uh, we, we relate the rise of resilience as a policy paradigm to the key failures of the 21st century in terms of uh, um, uh, in terms of state building, that is basically the solution proposed to the idea of state fragility. Uh, the two key failures, I mentioned that these two cases um, just before, of course, uh, can um, uh, are uh, the case of Iraq and the case of uh, Afghanistan, um, in which the international community responded uh, by acting within the policy paradigm of state fragility, but their failure uh, demonstrated the necessity of new ways of thinking about crisis and new ways of thinking about uh, how to provide solutions to this crisis. Um, when it comes to uh, resilience in a way uh, very much like uh, fragility, we see that there are different uh, uh, definitions, uh, uh, ways of understanding resilience. Um, uh, so they do share also these characteristics. Uh, when it comes to resilience, uh, uh, the term comes from um, different literature, different areas of studies uh, from uh, ecology to psychology, but also the risk management literature. Uh, what is meant by resilience is basically the capacity or the incapacity, uh, in, in the case we need to increase the resilience of a society, um, is the capacity of a society to adjust to an externally imposed change or shock. So in this case, this comes from the ecology literature that takes as a unit of analysis a complex system as a society. Uh, when it comes to the psychology literature, the focus is more on the individual, so the capacity, the cop coping mechanism of individuals to bounce back. Um, uh, so to face a shock or a crisis and to bounce back and eventually bounce back better. Um, when it comes to the risk management literature, one of the meaning attributed to resilience is the capacity of learning from adversity. Um, um, so basically it's not how, um, um, it, basically it's uh, 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 the process of learning out of a crisis, no? so to create a, a resilient mechanism to face the next crisis in a way. Um, in a way similar to fragility, they also share this. Uh, resilience gained policy and political popularity. Uh, we all know that um, there has been an increase in reference to resilience in uh, uh, key documents related to conflict uh, and crisis management, but not only. But also resilience attracted a great criticism um, sometimes referring to the fact that resilience is quite a vague um, or undefined term, so it doesn't really capture um, the reality on the ground, or sometimes it has also been criticized for justifying acting on the cheap, no? Uh, so basically uh, promoting types of intervention that are no more, uh, no longer informed by values, by those institutions and values that characterize the um, previous policy paradigms, but are instead a way to uh, justify um, 
more limited role uh, from uh, by uh, the European Union. And of course, again, I can uh, discuss more about the criticism against the resilience later on in the um, uh, in the um, in the discussion at the end of this uh, uh, in the at the end of the presentation. Um, what they uh, what fragility and resilience also share is, uh, as uh, I was uh, hinting at, is a certain level of ambiguity, um, a certain level of ambiguity that um, it's um, it's not by chance, it's not a mistake, but it's actually an ambiguity that is instrumental. Uh, in order to create um, uh, a degree of uh, um, uh, a common understanding between different actors. So the fact that uh, both fragility and resilience within the European Union uh, documents and uh, policy papers and so on are not uh, necessarily um, well defined uh, is actually instrumental to create uh, nonetheless a certain level or a basic understanding that is uh, shared uh, between different actors. And now we go into uh, the um, the analysis that uh, we uh, that we conducted. Um, as I said at the very beginning, we uh, compared uh, the two um, European Union uh, strategy, the 2003 and the 2016 European Union security strategies, based on four dimensions. The first one is the, the international system. So basically, we questioned. Uh, how these documents and all the documents that have been written together with these documents propose a different way of understanding the international system. Here um, in, in the table that you see, uh, you see basically uh, quotations from the two texts that, are, that I think are quite indicative of the way in which uh, um, these two policy paradigms understand differently the international system. So in 2003, um, uh, the document read, some, uh, read as, uh, um, said something along the line as that uh, Europe has never been so prosperous, so secure, nor so free. The violence of the first half of the, 20th, uh, of the 20th century has given way to a period of peace and stability unprecedented in Europe history. This is exactly in line with what I was uh, telling you uh, when presenting the fragility policy paradigms that is uh, imbued in, uh, is uh, uh, defined as uh, is part of a greater um, understanding um, of an international system that is uh, um, characterized by the end of history, you know, the liberal framework. Um, uh, Europe is uh, celebrating the fact that uh, it is prosperous, secure and free. And these um, um, are presented as uh, achievements uh, by the European Union uh, that also um, uh, describe a broader environment in which um, uh, Europe situates itself. So Europe is part of a, a general view um, that is based on this uh, idea of uh, prosperity, security and freedom. Uh, in comparison, and the comparison here is quite telling, in comparison only a few years later, basically, we are talking about uh, 13 years later, uh, the opening of the European Union global strategy starts with this word. We live in times of existential crisis within and beyond the European Union. Our union is under threat. Our European, uh, our European project, which has brought unprecedented peace, prosperity and democracy is being questioned. So here the European Union presents a completely different 
uh, international system and environment. It is a situation in which what prevails uh, is the fact is uh, an existential crisis. In another part of the documents, um, um, the European Union says that uh, its values and its way of life are under threats. So you can clearly see the changing in the way in which the European Union think and interpret the international system. In the first document in 2003, it was the apex of, um, uh, of a positive trend characterized by uh, prosperity, security, and freedom. In 2016, we see instead a crisis interpreted as an existential crisis of these um, achievements, um, not only of the European Union, but also so inside and outside the European Union. So the context has changed. We can also interpret this change at the international system um, uh, from the perspective of um, a way of uh, a liberal way uh, to a realist way in which what prevails is uh, rather the perception of uh, um, threats, insecurity, fear, and so on. So the prevailing of a realist way of interpreting the world. Now, uh, within this international system that the two policy paradigms um, understand in different ways, we can also situate uh, differently the way in which the European Union understand its role and also, generally speaking, the role of the international community. So in 2003, what the document say, um, said was that the European was inevitably a global player based on um, its identity, its positions, its achievement. The European Union was perceived as inevitably a global player. Um, as such, Europe, um, was to be ready to share uh, responsibility for global security and for building a better world. Again, these are uh, uh, parts of the documents themselves that speak for themselves, no? uh, in order to uh, let us understand what has been changed uh, in, um, in, uh, in the last decades. Um, there is an emphasis on um, the international community and within it the European Union um, as responsible actors for what happens um, in the world and uh, for addressing conflicts and crises. So um, crises are inevitable in this way of understanding the world, uh, but they are still um, solvable in a way, uh, thanks to uh, the role, the active role of global players such as the European Union and generally speaking, the capacity of the international community to react uh, and to adjust and to solve uh, conflict and crisis. In a uh, few, year, few years later, the position of the European Union worldwide um, and of the international community is slightly changed. Um, it's not that the European Union renounced its role of being a global player, no. Um, it still see itself and perceive itself as a global player, uh, but it also presents itself as if um, 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 as if uh, uh, there is a gap between what the European Union can do and what uh, uh, um, people, uh, citizens, and other states and other actors in the world expect it to do. Um, and here the quote uh, I took is uh, the following, a vast majority of our citizens understand 
understand that we need to collectively take responsibility for our role in the world. And whenever, wherever I travel, this is the opening by um, uh, Federica Mogherini, our partner expect the European Union to play a major role, including as a global security provider. Um, so in these documents, we see this gap between the uh, uh, what are the perceived capacity of the European Union and what are the expectations by other actors uh, towards the role of the European Union in um, uh, a number of different uh, um, areas, including conflict and crisis management. So here we don't see um, a huge change as um, the one that I showed you uh, before in terms of the international system itself, but we see that the European uh, Union is uh, uh, more wary of taking full responsibility for what happens outside its borders and in context of crisis and uh, conflict. Now, what about the problem? No, as I told you at the very beginning of this uh, of this lecture, uh, a policy paradigms serve the purpose of uh, identifying and interpreting a problem um, and finding the appropriate solution to solve this problem. So here, um, of course, when we refer to uh, the two documents, the two security strategy we are talking about uh, identifying threats to the European Union and identifying where these threats are located. So the locus of these threats. Here, what is the difference? In terms of the identification of the problem, um, we don't see uh, a massive change. In 2003, the European Union security strategy identified terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, regional conflict, state failure, and organized crime as the key threats to the European Union and to uh, security and peace, uh, international peace and security. So you see now uh, that state failure is included uh, among one of the threats. Uh, no? um, so it was mentioned uh, specifically in that document. Um, and of course, in, uh, in, in, in the broader understanding, state failure was also linked to all the other threats identified in the documents. In 2016, um, I didn't um, put that down in the slide, but we don't see such a big difference in terms of uh, the identified threats. So the 2016 global strategy still speak about terrorism, uh, regional conflict, organized crime, uh, crime. It also includes hybrid threats, uh, climate change. So it's not uh, non, uh, no longer limited to these uh, five uh, threats. There are more uh, threats, but there, uh, some of them are quite in common. So we don't see a massive change in terms of uh, what is the problem. What we see instead, uh, as a change uh, in between the two documents um, informed by the two policy paradigms is uh, uh, the location of these threats. So uh, uh, within the uh, fragility policy paradigms and as it is expressed in the 2003 uh, security strategy and in all the, do the documents related to, the, to it, um, the um, locus of these threats is located within the state. So the state has a central position in uh, identifying where uh, all these threats are coming from. It is the fragility of the states that allows um, crimi criminal networks to operate. It is the fragility of the state that allows terrorist organizations to operate and to threaten um, other states. It is the fragility of the state that allows for the outbreak of regional conflicts because it has international uh, consequences as well. With the 2016 um, European Union global strategy and within the framework of resilience as a new policy paradigm, 
we see instead that there is a change in these locus. So the state um, and its fragility and the problems related to the state, yes, are still there, uh, but are no longer the um, specific target of the European Union debate around resilience. Much more space is instead given to the level of society. This is in line, in part, with the, um, with the um, meaning of resilience that I uh, presented before. No? So the idea of uh, the capacity of a society to bounce back from, from a shock or a crisis or the individual coping mechanism um, uh, to, face, uh, um, to face a shock or a crisis. So here in the documents and in the debates around resilience, we see that the centrality becomes society, the, the, central, um, um, uh, the central locus of all these threats is no longer the state, but it is society. Uh, so, taken from the text, for instance, a resilient society featuring democracy, trust and institutions lies at the heart of a resilient state. States are resilient, resilient when societal fe societies feel they are becoming better off and have hope in the future. So, what is uh, uh, said? Um, uh, in the lines is that uh, the, um, uh, the uh, sustainability or uh, the um, solidity of the sta state rest with a resilient society. So the target of solutions to conflict and crisis are no longer the institutions of the states, but are rather uh, societal, um, societal institutions um, uh, where the focus is precise, is precise, is, um, um, it goes a step down, no, in a way. So uh, whether at the turn of the 21st century, the main target were state institutions, we need to build um, state institution, institutions to make uh, uh, countries recovering from, uh, from conflict or uh, crisis. Now we see this way of understanding interventions are are no longer targeted to the state, but rather addressing uh, societal issues. In practice, and of course, um, I'm, I'm not talking about the practice side, but we can uh, discuss it later on in, um, in the discussion. But if we want to give an example, think about the importance that has been given over the last few years to the issue of preventing violent extremism. That is no longer building, for instance, the security um, uh, capacity of the state, but it, it is also targeted to society, to individuals, uh, how to identify uh, violent extremists, for instance. Um, these are all measures that are targeted to society and no longer the states. The state. Last dimension, what solutions these two policy paradigms propose? So in line with the 2003 security strategy and with the policy paradigm of state fragility, the main solutions were basically an institutional transfer from the model that we all uh, that we know in Western countries. So our uh, institutions of states and basically transferring them to conflict and post-conflict countries. No? Um, uh, this has been often described as uh, uh, a universal and uh, blueprint type of intervention because it didn't allow to see differences between conflict and crisis context. Mm? Uh, the same institutional architecture should work from one context to, to the other. Also because of course it was informed by um, 
uh, a strong uh, liberal ideology. No? So the institutions that make liberal democracy and an open uh, economy work should be the one that needs to be transferred to conflict and post-conflict crisis. Once these institutions are working, um, this country will, um, uh, will be able to recover from a conflict situation. In 2016, in line with all what I said just before, in terms of the understanding of the international system, but particularly the understanding of the role of the European Union and of the international community in conflict and crisis context, we see a different interpretation. First of all, there is the uh, pretty realistic um, assessment that there, that there is no magic wand to solve crisis. So there are no neat recipes to impose solution elsewhere. This is um, in a way uh, a much needed assessment uh, that is also a reflection of a process of learning in a way um, at the international level and within, of the Euro within the European Union on the limits of its uh, uh, approach to conflict and crisis. So recognizing uh, that there is no one size fits all solutions. This also calls into, um, uh, into question um, the assumptions that were uh, relevant up until uh, the beginning of the 21st century. No? So this idea that uh, uh, institution building was not only feasible but uh, um, necessary for solving conflict and crisis. Uh, and here we see also um, uh, another way in which uh, we can see the affirmation of a more realistic assessment um, in the quotes that basically says that uh, in, um, uh, in approaching uh, the um, foreign and security policy of the European Union, the European Union will be, yes, of course, guided by its principles, but uh, it should also be guided in a realistic assessment of the current environment. Uh, what is uh, in the text and later on, later on also um, developed idea of a principle paradigm, pragmatism, sorry, of a principled pragmatism. So the European Union says, uh, we as European Union should be careful in understanding what we can do in each context. And if we cannot do much, we won't do much. This is in contrast to um, the um, liberal revolutionary ethos at the turn of the 21st century that was uh, instead proposing somehow to uh, change the entire world um, as a reflection of the institutions and the models present in Western countries. Here we see a more um, uh, yes, a more pragmatic approach based on a clear assessment of what can be done in terms of a context and in terms also of our own role, I'm speaking our in terms of the European Union role in conflict and crisis management. In practice, um, this has uh, this uh, translated, for instance, in types of uh, in an approach that favored security over uh, governance uh, issues. So, um, if a situation doesn't allow um, 
uh, a greater role on behalf of the European Union, we should limit our uh, engagement and so also our responsibility to uh, basic tasks such as the provision of security or the provision of basic services. This is how, in a way, we can see the translations of this policy paradigm centered around the notion of resilience translated into practice. And of course, I can tell you more later on in terms of uh, uh, examples, for instance. Coming to a conclusion, so basically this is a table uh, that um, tries to sum up uh, the analysis that I just presented. Uh, so basically, as you can see, these are the four dimensions that uh, we analyzed, um, uh, divided, of course, by the two policy paradigms. So uh, uh, if we look at the international system, uh, we see uh, that uh, um, 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 that uh, crises are perceived as a breach in an ordered and liberal system, while a crisis, according to the resilience paradigm, is considered as something normal in a contested and realist system. When it comes to the locus of the threats, as I said, there is a shift from a focus on the state to uh, more attention given to uh, society. Mm? Uh, and when it comes to way of understanding solutions, we see uh, that uh, uh, we see a difference in the way in which the European un Union understand the role, its role and the role of international community in a crisis uh, from uh, being responsible and active within the fragility policy paradigms to um, being much more uh, marginal within the resilience paradigm. And in terms of the type of intervention, we see universal and top-down model uh, solutions to conflict and crisis, uh, while um, in the resilience policy paradigms, we see it as a minimal context-based and bottom-up type of uh, intervention. Conclusion, so what we can say about, uh, um, okay, what, 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 why do we need to see all these changes uh, and what uh, do uh, these changes tell us about uh, the European Union uh, and the European Union foreign and security uh, policy? Um, the first thing that uh, I want to highlight uh, is that this shift in understanding uh, crisis and conflict is more about uh, the uh, EU self-perceptions and ideas rather than a reaction to um, radical changes in conflict and crisis. So this change is more a reflection of the European Union thinking and ways of interpreting rather than a neat and clear change in contextual realities. Uh, we can talk about it, uh, of course, uh, because we can actually see some also some new trends in conflict and crisis, uh, but they are not so uh, key uh, to uh, drive uh, um, to drive the change from one policy paradigm to the other. So we actually think that these changes reflect more the position of the European Union. So the way in which um, it, uh, um, uh, it, uh, the European Union think about itself and its position in the world rather than contextual factors. The second um, point that I want to raise um, 
is that uh, if we look at it from this perspective, fragility and resilience, although the latter has been um, has grown out from the failure of the first policy paradigm, so the failure of state fragility, we can actually think of them as the two faces of the same coin. So it is still an idea, it is still Western ways based and formed assumption that informs how uncertainty in the periphery is interpreted and acted upon. So again, these policy paradigms are based on Western uh, rooted and formed assumptions. So they say more about the position of Western actors rather than um, differences in conflict and crisis. A last point that I want to uh, highlight in the conclusion is that uh, in this shift from uh, um, understanding solutions to conflict and crisis uh, that are geared towards uh, society and contextual based bottom up solutions, we can also see uh, that the international community seeks to um, withdraw partially its own responsibility towards uh, this um, context of crisis and conflict giving instead uh, more responsibility or maybe devolving the onus uh, to local agency. So in this idea that uh, we no longer have a working model to uh, transfer to conflict and crisis context allows also to give more space to local agency in the process of recovering or um, uh, in the process of recovering from conflict and crisis. So I think I'll stop here and um, I'm happy to, to discuss or to answer all the questions you have. Well, thank you very much, Irene. I am... Um... So yes, I like to give the 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 the, the, the opportunity to uh, the students to ask questions. As mentioned, you can, uh, uh, if you have no problem in being taped, you can turn on your video and ask a question directly. Or if you prefer, for whatever reason, you can uh, um, ask a question in the chat. If there is no question, or when the questions are finished. We'll just thank Irene Costantini and go to dinner, I guess, or anyone, anywhere. Um, I say this to suggest I'm not, um, I am, uh, this is done for you, meaning for the students, and so I'm not asking questions. Chiara, please. I don't know if you want to tape the question. Or, oh, ah, okay, please. Yes. Um, I don't know if I uh, am going to ask a question that goes from in a different direction from what you said, but. Reading your article, uh, I found that, that you said there are new explanations for insecurity and threat like climate change. And I thought about how um, Western powers have been accused by some states of using also climate change as an excuse to intervene in other states. Uh, for example, Bolsonaro, when he said that the Amazon forest should not be considered a World Heritage Site, and that, I mean, Mm, all the other countries used to have forests, but they destroyed them because of uh, sake of development. So I was thinking, and um, mostly I wanted to ask you, if possible, your opinion. Um, is, is it true that probably the green movement is used in a way uh, like resilience, like as an excuse to intervene somehow, or 
And yeah, that's, that's my impression if it's clear. Okay, first of all, thank you for the question, um, which will make me think. Um, yes, so in the European Union global strategy, um, we see more threats added to the list. Um, now, uh, whether um, the climate um, uh, is becoming or will become um, a new justification for intervention, I actually don't have the answer to this question. Um, since, um, I mean, so far we haven't seen it, um, uh, or we haven't seen it clearly, but what I can tell is that of course there is a, um, uh, there is a, a, um, an attention or at least a, um, at least a rhetorical attention, but I think it's going to translate into uh, a programmatic attention uh, towards linking uh, program, programs uh, and, and does also solutions to conflict uh, to climate uh, to climate change. Um, how this is gonna happen and how um, and in which ways this is gonna translate into policy solutions, uh, it's still something that, well, I don't have an answer to it. But of course, we, uh, we are seeing that there is more and more, um, it is a necessity, of course, but there is also this uh, um, uh, new way of uh, linking these two domains, conflict and climate change. Uh, resilience, of course, can be uh, the way in which uh, we can all tie uh, everything together, no? Uh, because a resilient uh, society, as we said, is a society that is capable of reacting to a shock. So, um, but the, the, the nature of the shock is not, uh, um, uh, is not given. No? So this shock can be a man-made shock or it can be an environmental shock. Um, of course, uh, um, uh, 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 one of the key problems with resilience, and this is, uh, uh, you know, a, gener a more general comment, is uh, how we can then move from uh, this policy paradigm uh, to its implementations, because so far we have seen it mostly as an excuse for a reduced engagement in conflict and crisis, uh, driven by uh, less economic resources available, less political will also available, uh, but we haven't seen uh, how resilience can translate into uh, actual um, uh, informing uh, new ways of finding solutions to conflict and crisis. And I think uh, I tried to answer your, your question, uh, but perhaps, um, uh, well, I don't know uh, to what extent I've answered. Okay, thank you. Uh, Beatrice. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, do you think that the current institutional and uh, operational structure of the uh, European External Action and the CSDP is suited for putting in action such a pragmatic and context-based approach, which is the resilience approach? Or is there the need uh, uh, for uh, reforms and changes in these, uh, in these terms? Thank you. Okay. Um, no, I, I'm not. Moved. Okay. Um, whether the institutional structure of the, uh, at the European Union level is uh, uh, capable of providing um, uh, solutions to conflict and crisis as it is now. Um, I think it's not really a matter of the institutional structure. I think here what really is important, and this is a point that I, ra I raised at the very beginning of this uh, lecture, is that, of course, when we analyze the discourse, we see that there is one discourse at the European Union. 
And uh, um, as I said, this is also helped by the fact that uh, um, usually the concept that define the strategy of the European Union are um, um, uh, are often built around this uh, constructive ambiguity, you know, so that they can actually um, find a common position or that the same position can be shared among different actors. Uh, here, the problem is that these, uh, these policy paradigms and this way of thinking translate into practice. So here, I don't see really an issue in terms of the institutional capability of the European Union in itself, but I rather see that tension between the European Union and the member states. Uh, so if you think about one of the crises that is of, uh, I would say, of most interest for the European Union and the European countries, um, uh, is, for instance, Libya. Uh, and in the case of Libya, it is pretty clear that um, um, we haven't seen, um, uh, we haven't seen uh, a convergence between the European Union position and some of its member states. Uh, so I think that in order to translate uh, resilience as a policy paradigm into actual solutions, into actual programs and so on, uh, one of the key problems is actually the tension between the institution of the European Union and its member states that apparently are um, becoming uh, quite an important obstacle in order to translate a strategic, um, you know, a security strategy into a uh, into the implementation of this security strategy. Thank you, Irene. Um, I'm not sure I see anyone else. Uh, I perhaps I can wait. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to? Um, ask a question or, or make a comment or um, Irene just came back from Baghdad, by the way, I don't I think I did not mention it. So <laughs> for me, it's very exciting in a way. I mean, it's, a, it's um, interesting. Certainly it was not a boring trip, I guess, <laughs> I guess. So, if, I'm, so if there are no more comments, I guess we'll um, we'll, uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll stop here. And um, um, so uh, again, thank you very much, Irene Costantini, for being with us today to talk about uh, the European Union uh, and policy paradigms from fragility to resilience, uh, and um, and uh, and to everyone else. So basically, to the students in my class, so we'll see each other next uh, week. And uh, and thank you again all for participating. I'm going to stop the. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Elena.